Hey folks, I'm talking today with Stephen Baskerville. He is a professor of government at Patrick Henry College. I first became acquainted with his work way back in 2007 with a book called Taken Into Custody that I think is the definitive work on the corruption and all the other problems in our family court system uh, in the West. Uh, welcome, Stephen. I'm really glad to be having this conversation with you. Thank you. It's good to be here. And we're going to talk about a different book today. Uh, the, by the way, there's a link to Taken Into Custody below. You want to get a copy of that. It's great reading. But today we're going to be talking about this, uh, A Gentleman's Guide to Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World. Um, I can't wait till we get to that last part. Um, Stephen, why did you write this book? Well, it was kind of partly a book I really kind of wrote for fun, but there's a serious side, of course. Um, it's, uh, you know, I'd written a couple of books on, uh, I wrote my book on divorce taken into custody and, and a broader book on the, on the sexual revolution. Uh, and they were semi-scholarly books, very serious books, very uh, heavy books. A lot of people find them heavy and even kind of depressing reading because they deal with such unpleasant uh, subjects. Uh, and so I thought it was, and yet, you know, I write about these things and I, I try to lay bare the divorce industry and the other injustices, and yet, you know, nothing changes. So I wanted to write something a little lighter, a little more entertaining, but also something from a more subjective standpoint, the standpoint of the individual man, uh, trying to live his life, not necessarily engaged in politics, um, not necessarily engaged in, in big issues, but just trying to lead a, a normal, sane life, a, a better life. Uh, and uh, that's where this book came from. These, these books, of course, go back to the Renaissance. It's a very old genre of, of writing, uh, you know, the older men writing books for younger men mostly about how to, uh, how to be a man, how to be a gentleman, how to uh, manners and, and comportment and so forth. So I thought, you know, the old, old genre needed a little dusting off and, and maybe reformulating a bit, but uh, uh, that, that was the idea, was that this, this, this old traditional uh, style of writing uh, has things to say to us today. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I really, a lot of this resonated with me. I want to say, especially at the beginning, where you're talking about really decorum in, in men and the way they present themselves to the world, the way they dress, uh, their, their behavior in public, those things, you treat it with some humor. But we have absolutely lost something along those lines with men in, in, in this age. What happened? I mean, we went from uh, people understanding that if you, if you dressed a, a particular way, people would treat you differently, depending on how you present yourself to the world. And the better you did, the better the world treated you. We seem to have lost that. And we've also lost a lot of, I don't know, propriety even between men these days? What do you think happened? A couple of things, one kind of general and, and one more specific to men. The general thing I think is, you know, the, the growth of liberalism, the, the growth of, you know, the, the individual, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, re relaxation of traditional standards, traditional uh, religious beliefs, traditional um, communities, uh, family values, these sorts of things. Um, the growth of, you know, individualism, a more laid back, uh, uh, relaxed form of life, which, you know, you dress as you like, you act as you like, as, as long as you're not hurting anybody. This ethic generally has been, you know, has, has taken over so much of the world. Liberalism in a, in a very broad sense, uh, ethical and, and, and cultural, as well as a uh, political liberalism. But I think the second, the more particular thing is that this has affected, uh, affected men uh, more uh, than women, um, detrimentally. Uh, um, you know, you, it's very common. I, I noticed this first in Eastern Europe during the 1990s, but now I see it in the Western world as well. I, I, it's very common to see uh, a couple, uh, you know, elegantly dressed woman uh, next to a man uh, who looks like a, you know, superannuated teenager uh, dressing the same way as, as, as a boy might dress. And I think this has affected men's self-respect. I think they're, they're afraid to, um, to this liberal laid back way of life has affected men. It's made them feel self-conscious about being men, about insisting upon their status as men and upon their, the respect that, that men demand in order to be men, in order to be masculine, uh, in order to fulfill the responsibilities that they have. So it's, um, I think this enforced kind of enforced informality 
um, almost obligatory, you know, um, informality has had a detrimental impact on men because men have responsibilities and the way they dress and the way they comport themselves are um, extensions of those responsibilities. You know, and I've, I've noticed this too, even in communication, I wonder how much the internet has to do with this. Um, I still find myself in emails formatting letters <laughs> in, in, in the old world style. And often I get back communication from younger men, honestly, that looks like a third grader might have, have written it. Uh, no attention to punctuation or any kind of detail or any kind of solid good communication skills. Do you think that's part of the same phenomena? As oh, absolutely, yes. There are entire books and websites about you know electronic uh, etiquette and email etiquette and this sort of thing, which I, I touch on a bit and allude to others uh, on that. Um, because yes, it's an outgrowth of it, the inability to communicate uh, you know, clearly, properly, respectfully, politely, um, in a way that shows respect and, and uh, you know, a desire to, to communicate and not waste some of the leader's time. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's a, a very much a part of it. The, the guidebooks have, over the centuries talked about you know, the importance of letter writing, the importance of uh, written communication as well as oral communication, or training in things like rhetoric and grammar uh, in our traditional educations. Uh, and that's, you know, much of that is, is, has gone out the window or been watered down. So um, yes, there are consequences. How much of this liberalism, as you've expressed it, has been able to take root because of the absence of fathers in the home? Uh, well, very much so. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's caused the absence of fathers, but it's also uh, taken root. Yes, fathers were traditionally the, you know, the guardians, the upholders of the standards. Uh, they were the, the people that teach children to uh, interact uh, with the outside world, with the rest of the, of the world. Um, as Howard Schwartz says in, a, in, in, a, in his writings and, and others have pointed this out, that the, the father exists kind of to help the child wean the child from the, from the breast and from the, the womb and to, to, to go out and, and face and confront and, and engage with the world. And um, I think, you know, that, that, that's, I mean, we know the horrendous statistics about what happens in, to individual children and entire communities when there's no fathers. And um, you know, that's, I think that's a large part of it is that the father is there to, you know, to, to create men uh, and to uh, teach girls uh, what to look for in men. And when that's missing, uh, then you know, the children have to make it up as they go along and they make it up with gangs and with you know, emotional disturbances and with uh, you know, truancy and, and various forms of rebellion, which um, you know, the fathers were there to help um, you know, channel into constructive purposes. Well, you know, and also, you know, we, we know from research that fathers are responsible for creating empathy in children. And this is one of the things that's sorely lacking in those families. Uh, I don't want to wander too far outside the scope of the book, but what do we do about that? I mean, we, we now live in a fatherless culture for all practical purposes. And how does that ever get reversed? Well, good question. I mean, the, the, writing the book was part of that. It was part of that too. You know, so, so, so men who don't have children, uh, sorry, men who don't have fathers, uh, young men especially who, who didn't have fathers, can learn some of the rules of this book and learn to not only to, to make up what they didn't have, but also to, to reestablish the connection with their own children if they have them, to, you know, so they can, can restart, restart the process and um, be good fathers uh, you know, to, their own, to their own children. Um, so it's, it's Part of that, it's not. I, have to, I hasten to add, it is not part of the genre of responsible. What, what we used to call responsible fatherhood, and so much we see. The purpose of the book is not to trash men. Uh, I mean, we can all do better. We can all start when we're trying to figure out what to do about the world and what to do about this larger crisis of fatherlessness. We should all start with ourselves. We should all start with what we can do better. You know, the sin within and so forth. Uh, it's not to say that I'm I, I, I'm trashing men or to say that you know, it's, it's all men's fault because it, it clearly isn't. But one premise of the book is that men have to start with themselves. So there's no welfare agency to take care of men. Um, uh, being a man is always, you always start with first principles. You always have to, you, know, you can't look to some, someone else to help you. You have to, have to take the initiative yourself. And so you know, this book is a, a step in that regard. And I hope that men who read it will, um, will see it that way. They'll look at it as, as you know, how they, in just their ordinary daily lives, they don't have to join great political causes. I, I think it's good if they do in some instances, 
but it's not necessary. You, you just you can by your example and by your interaction with other people, other men, uh, your own children, your own families, you can start to um, to rebuild, you know, a world with fathers and with men. Okay, great. Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, that is a subject. My audience wants to hear about this. This is a topic that is so current for men today, the subject of marriage. And I want to bring up something you wrote in the book. I have it here somewhere. <clears throat> you said, and this is about the family court system on page 175, and I'm going to read most of this paragraph here. It's one of the best descriptions I've ever read about the family court system. And you're saying you must further understand that the divorce courts are not unfair or inefficient and the judges are not biased or stupid or in need of education. They're crooked. They know precisely what they're doing and they do it with ruthless efficiency. They may mouth feminist cliches at one moment and then turn around and profess pieties about, the tradi about traditional motherhood the next but these simply wrapped, rationalize what really drives them, which is money and power. The courts are run by venal judges, lawyers, and civil servants who are all united in one object, to take control over your children and to use them as leverage to loot and criminalize you. Um, why, would a, why would a man do this? Why would a man get married? In, into why would he marry the state in that system? Right. Well, that was the hardest part of the book to write, I have to say, on the whole, the whole session. Because on the one hand, I didn't want to in any way uh, water down or, or dilute or create any illusions about what men who marry and have children have, are up against. And I've, you know, I've written two books out, previous books about it, and many articles. Uh, and I didn't want to belabor the point, but I wanted to make it very clear that you know um, that that's that that's true. I mean, these these injustices are there, and they cannot be denied uh, for a minute. Um, and and you have to face it. You have to know that this is the way it is. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I, yeah. And but that's, and a, but that's really not answering my question. My question is, why would any man look at this and know that that's the truth, and say, right. yeah, I'll sign up. I'll do that. I'll sign up to put my right. neck on the chopping block. Aren't you, in effect, suggesting that men walk into a minefield wearing snowshoes? Well, I, I do, in the end, <clears throat> come down in favor of you know marriage and children. And yes, I had to confront the MGTOW movement because that's the obvious logical purpose. And uh, and I have to say that about and I didn't want to be another chief shot at the MGTOW movement because that, they've got a lot of positive things to, to be said for them. Factually, to your credit, I, I read it all. You did not take cheap shots, and I want my audience to know that there's no cheap shots in here at the MGTOW movement. But there is, and you, I come back here to page 169, it says, when it comes to wanting children, and I'm assuming you're not advocating for children outside of legal Correct. matrimony. So this is, why should you persist in wanting marriage and children? In addition to the reasons given above, a gentleman does not cower or retreat permanently in the face of the enemy. Well, yes and no. Um, a, an individual facing overwhelming opposition and danger realistically does avoid it, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Um, and uh, I can understand that. And, and again, uh, I think that uh, in some instances, the, you know, the MGTOW response is entirely justified in some ways. If your aim is to uh, call attention to the injustices, then yes, it's it's a, an effective way of doing that. I hope. I, I hope. If your aim is to boycott marriage and family until the injustices are corrected, I think even that is is defensible. I, I think you know if you if your aim the purpose of a strike if, if this is a marriage strike as Helen Smith calls it and others, uh, then it's defensible. If your if your purpose is to exert your leverage, like any strike, and you know try to uh, and get the, the injustices, the abuses, the grievances are rectified, then that's true. Where I draw the line, though, and where I, you know, I think men need to think about this seriously, and that is, um, you know, as a permanent lifestyle, uh, checking out of, you know, as human, checking out of, of women, marriage, family, to varying degrees, 
um, entirely and adopting a life of, of, of singleness, celibacy, uh, uh, you know, indefinitely or permanently. I think we're denying something that is of us that's human. I think the human, you know, as a species, we are hardwired to want to reproduce. Um, it's it's something, uh, you know, it's the order of the of the, of the of the the biosphere. You know, every living creature strives to 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 reproduce its its kind or to die in the process. Um, and I think that, you know, as a man, there are times when you might be called upon to face overwhelming odds. And there have men have done that. The, you know, the charge of the light brigade. Um, what was the famous example of the British ship in the, in the 19th century? I forget the name uh, now um, of the, 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 the gentleman who knew, their, they knew the sailors who knew their ship was going down. So they, they dressed in their, their dress whites and they stood on the, on the, on the bridge and they, and they at attention and they went down with the ship. Um, I'm not advocating suicide. I'm not advocating, uh, you know, uh, hopelessness. That there's, if there's any way to do it strategically better, but but I, I can't see completely giving up uh, as a man, as a gentleman, as a human being, um, the desire, the, the quest for uh, you know female companionship, female company, lifelong marriage, a home. I think that's another human need is a, a need for a home that you provide for and you protect against the outside world. The family, I believe very strongly, is a the main bulwark, the main defense and barrier against totalitarian, the totalitarian state. It's a, it's a little polity, as the Puritans used to call it, a little commonwealth, uh, where a man and a woman to learn to, to rule uh, other people, their children, uh, before they uh, and themselves. And I can't see giving up. So if you're talking about a kind of MGTOW movement that's completely apolitical and completely uh, you know, self, self-centered, I can't see that. I, I can't endorse that. I think yeah, we have to. I'm really not speaking of the movement per se. I'm I'm just asking the the question, just putting it out there, right. as an individual, uh, right. not as a member of any club or anything like that. Uh, I'm 20 years in the same relationship. I'm very happy that way. And I think, by the way, you're absolutely right. Men are wired to pair bond. We we can try to deny that to our own peril. I think. Uh, but we are wired to pair bond. Whether or not I'm wired to pair bond with the state is another question, uh, because that is in essence what a marriage contract is in the West right now. You are, and you point this out explicitly in your book that you say the moment you have a child, your rights are gone. And you also imply the moment you have a wife in, in that. You're saying wife too, your rights are gone. Uh, and, I, and I'm not trying to give you a hard time here, but I'm not hearing why I should look at that and say, okay, for the sake of humanity, I'm going to put my neck on the chopping block and hand a woman a loaded gun and uh, all the state functionaries she could possibly dream of uh, to support her cause and, and to be vulnerable to that in a divorce rate of 50% or more. I'm just, it's not computed. I, I'm no. just not getting it. Right. As an individual, and you're right, much of the MGTOW thing is not a movement. It's, it's the spontaneous actions of men looking at the, the, the situation objectively. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and I think, you know, a huge amount of, uh, you know, looking at this phenomenon uh, that, for example, Helen Smith, among others, Glenn Sachs and others have pointed this out many times. Uh, and to see to, to confront this as and, and to, to to write it off as male puerility, I'm thinking of you know the book of what's the book by is it the, not Heather McDonald but it's um, a woman and scholar at the Manhattan Institute I think um, uh, who wrote this book about men being little boys um, uh, I forget her name the author's name uh, very very scholarly book actually in some ways and a respected scholar but um, it, it's it's just uh, Austria, it's, it's burying your head in the sand, um, you know, for, for, our, for our pundits and our scholars and our, our intellectuals to look at the, the situation and just say, oh, it's male plurality, it, it's madness, it's just utter, if there's anything sticking your head in the sand, it's that. So we've got to find ways to, to um, you know, to call attention. Yes, I can understand, but, you know, be very careful in marriage. And that's not an answer, by the way. It's not an answer to say, be careful who you marry. Uh, that's not the solution either. Because we all know uh, the woman you divorce is not the woman you marry. Very true. And, and it's not, you know, we don't, we don't say, uh, you know, if, 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 we don't, if the police came to our house after a burglary and said, well, it's, it's your fault, sir. You really shouldn't live in a neighborhood with burglars. Um, you know, we, we would be shocked at that. So that, that's no solution either. 
Um, but I think even if you're choosing the, the, this path of, of enforced celibacy uh, temporarily, I, I don't think we should ever give up hope that, um, you know, that, that you will be called to, um, not everyone is, some people are called to celibacy, of course, priests and others. Uh, uh, but, um, but, you know, I, I think you need to search your soul very, very carefully and, and ask about that. If there's a way uh, I don't think we should ever withdraw from the, you know, the, the political situation of the world. We are citizens as well as men, and we need to, you know, speak up about these things and why why we make the choices we make, uh, and um, you know, and do so vocally and and uh, you know, as part of the as our contribution to the civic culture, and never stop this. And if every man did this, I mean, as Daniel Amneus used to point out, if, if all the men that were victims of this, or all the men generally, were to speak out or to organize. <clears throat> This problem would be, uh, they would have enormous power and, and these problems would, would just disappear. Um, so, uh, you know, we mustn't, mustn't give up hope on this, uh, that, you know, these things can be rectified. Because again, as a man, you are, you know, again, part of the title is, of the book is ruling the world. And, and you know, being a gentleman, to get back to the theme of the book, is not just a matter of, you know, uh, accoutrements. It's not the matter of just, uh, you know, tying a tie or mixing a martini or how to pass the plates at a dinner party. It's a matter of being part of the culture, including part of the, the civic culture, how to rule the, the domain that God or circumstances have given you uh, as part of your daily life. And, and the history of the, of the gentlemanly ideal has always involved some form of ruling, some form of uh, administration, of being a, you know, if it's only yourself, if it's only your dormitory room, but, or if it's only your, you know, your, your, your wife and children, or if it's only your, you know, being part of of your neighborhood, but there's always been men who are in any way active and more than just passive uh, are in some sense part are contributors to the civic culture and to the um, you know to the to the community, including the civic uh, political community, if you like, that they're a part of. You'll get no argument from me about that. Um, let me ask you something. Also, you mentioned religion. Uh, not you don't dwell on the topic in the book, but it, it certainly comes up. Is it required to be a Christian to be a gentleman? That's interesting. Um, interesting question. Um, is it uh, historically? And I do deal a little with the history. It, it is part of it. Uh, I argue that the gentlemanly ideal is a, a specifically, in many ways, a specifically Anglophone phenomenon. Something that grew up. It has other other equivalents, but it's similarities. But it's really something that grew up specifically in the English speaking world specifically in England and, and other countries that were influenced by, by England and the, and, the, and the British Empire, frankly. Um, and so it's, it is a Western uh, concept the way it exists now, so far. And it is in many ways an Anglophone concept. So it is, it, it is inseparable from Christianity in many ways. It goes back, books like mine go back to the Renaissance. Right. Uh, there was a huge contribution by, from the Puritans during the Reformation. The English Puritans had a big role in injecting an, an ethical concept, an, an ethical dimension into the concept of a gentleman, telling men that you know it's not enough to have a nice house and, and all the accoutrements of being a gentleman, but you have to be ethically answerable to God. And uh, so, and the Puritans, of course, are the ones who, in many ways, have brought it to, to across the ocean to America, and and also spread it to other English-speaking countries, including uh, you know Canada, Australia, and places like India and the Netherlands and Nigeria. Having said that, uh, the modern concept of a gentleman, it has been pointed out by others, it, it is not necessarily uh, the same thing as, as Christianity. It's not exactly the same. The ideal is a, um, there are aspects of it uh, that are not Christian. Um, and so it is not, uh, it, it, the ideal can be taken over uh, and, I'm, and certainly has been. I've certainly known men in my time who fit the ideal very, very well, who are not Christians, uh, gentlemen of, of, of other faiths. But I think one thing that Christianity did contribute to it was the idea that it could elevate anybody. Anybody could be part of this ideal. It, 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 originally the idea, and in many other cultures, the idea is limited to a very small class or caste of, of men at the top of the social hierarchy. But what Christianity has done to it all the way through, I think, especially in the United States, is infuse the idea that anyone can be a gentleman. It's not limited to a social class of, um, you know, uh, the English gentry or aristocracy, uh, or even to a, a country that has an aristocracy. It's, it's, it's possible in a democratic country, in a republican country. Uh, and so 
I think there's an element of that. Uh, you know, Christianity contributed that kind of missionary purpose to it. But, um, and someone I read just the other day, a guidebook that said that, you know, Je Jesus Christ was the first, uh, first, first gentleman. Uh, you can accept that or not. But, uh, well, that's what I have to say on, on Christianity. It's, it's an integral part of it historically and substantively, but um, others can, can also partake. Okay. Um, incidentally, what we know looking through history is probably in the 12th century uh, was the emergence of the model of romantic love uh, that uh, we have today involving the work of Eleanor of Aquitaine, her daughter, and commissioning troubadours to scatter to the winds and preach the virtues of romantic love. How much of an impact does that have today? And is that impact positive? Good question. And I know a lot of men I've consulted on that. I've not investigated that the way I'd like to, I'd like to do that. You know, the code of knighthood, the code of chivalry, you're, uh, you're alluding to the code of, of um, courtly love, of course. And all of those things uh, contributed to it. They contributed to the relations of the sexes. They, but they also, some people argue, uh, idealized, even romanticized, uh, sentimentalized women in a way that is um, probably not good for women or for men. Uh, and I've not really looked into that the way I'd like to, I'd like to that would require some historical study. Um, but I, I do say, uh, one thing I do point out is that, uh, and others have pointed this out, but the concept of chivalry is not limited to um, protecting or honoring women. Um, it's, it, it extends to the idea of, of protecting and honoring anyone who is disadvantaged, who is weak, who is the uh, victim of injustice. And it means doing so in, a, in an individual level. In other words, you don't just, if you think there's injustice in the world and in grievances, you don't just join political causes and put forth political ideologies. You help the guy right there, the beggar, the man on the street, the homeless man uh, or woman uh, who needs your help right there, face to face. Um, and so uh, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, and, and one, of the, one of the things I, I pointed out, others have pointed this out too, is, is the, you know, the, the, the failure, there's a lot of cheap chivalry. There's a lot of cheap chivalry today. I see it uh, in, in, uh, in some men. I see it, in, I see it ironically, and I, I did an article on this in Crisis Magazine. Um, even those conser some conservative politicos who want, to, who want to bring back this ideal, who sympathize and want to bring back the gentlemanly ideal, uh, they've got a highly romanticized and sentimentalized view of women, that women can do no wrong, and that all sinners are men. Uh, and this is, this is certainly not Christian. Uh, and, and it's infantilizing of, of, of women, uh, ridiculously. And if the yeah, object Aaron, was to infantilize women, they've done a great job. Precisely. Yes, it does. It does, it does infantilize women. And um, it's uh, yeah, Aaron Wren did this or piece recently on his site about this, and you know it's certainly not not Christian at all. Uh, and so it's um, yeah, I think I think we should examine that. We should we should you know we we need to if we're going to hark back to chivalry and romantic love, we need to kind of take the whole package in some ways and not pick and choose the bits that um, we think are you know politically acceptable today and that won't cause us any trouble. And I can respect respectfully suggest to you, Stephen, and to anyone else interested that a good place to begin that examination is at Peter Wright's excellent website, gynocentrism.com, where he goes over the, the historic, the, the history of this uh, with a fine tooth combed and does a, an amazing job at, at explaining what happened and how it's impacted us today, recommended reading uh, for anybody. Let me ask you something else. This is called, uh, one more time, so everybody can see the book. It's a gentleman's guide. Um, if I went through here with a search and replace through the entire book and found the word gentleman and replaced it with the word man, would it work? No, no, it wouldn't. Partly because, uh, well, to be a gentleman, it presupposes to be a man. And I, I consulted, uh, there's, a, there's a large genre of books nowadays, how to be a man. Um, a number, number of fairly good ones uh, about how to be a man, how to wrestle a grizzly bear, how to do battle with a crocodile. No, I'm, I'm caricaturing because some of them are good. Um, a gentleman, is, it's more than that. As I said, it's, it's, it involves uh, you know, a certain level of refinement. Uh, it, it all involves a certain level of, I, again, I would say ruling 
that we that, that really grew up in the in the English speaking world. I guess if I had to encapsulate the difference, I would say it's the it, it, what's required of a, a man must show courage, but a gentleman must show moral courage. I would invoke the distinction between physical courage and moral courage. I see a lot of men today. I don't think we're, we have any problem with physical courage. I see a lot Agreed. of very physically courageous men in the military, in the art, in the law enforcement, and you know, construction, uh, aviation, dangerous occupations. There's no problem with that. I see a shortage of moral courage. Uh, sometimes in the very men who are calling for, uh, you know, for more manliness. Again, like some of the conservative politicos who, who want to want us to be more manly. Uh, I think some of them are a little bit um, sheepish when it comes to um, anything that might upset the, uh, you know, the ladies. Uh, and I think moral courage is what a gentleman is the difference. I would say that we, we need more moral courage, all of us, uh, to stand up for what's morally correct for the disadvantaged, even when the disadvantaged are uh, themselves, you know, politically incorrect or uh, unpopular, or when it might cost us something when it might uh, harm our own popularity or our own you know affluence or whatever privileges power and that's what i, I think uh, the difference between just being manly and being gentlemanly you know and a, a lot of, of what i see i totally agree with that and a lot of what i see in terms of the lack of moral courage and moral clarity in men is in their relationships with women it's where they become absolute cowards uh, this is why we have, you know, Republicans out there preaching courage and, and perhaps preaching old school chivalry in the romantic sense, and then signing on to VAWA and other corrupt legislation. Um, what do you say to the criticism, Stephen, that right now traditionalists, and I would respectfully refer to you as a traditionalist, but at the same time, there's an attitude I would say, at least in my community, that tra traditionalists are to men's issues what rhinos are to conservative politics. How do you respond to that sort of criticism? Well, it's, it's true in some ways in practice. I mean, I, again, I wrote an article in Crisis Magazine and I wrote another one more recently in Chronicles Magazine where I take on other people who have, other men who have, who have put forth this gentlemanly ideal and show that many times they have, they've debased the, the very ideal that they're, they're proposing. And I think conservatives and traditionalists have a lot to answer for in this, in their, you know, the way they've uh, debased, uh, you know, cheapened the currency of, of manliness and gentlemanliness. So I, I think that's true. But you're right, I am a traditionalist in many ways. I do feel like the, you know, the, the old rules are tried and true. I think they sometimes need to be reformulated in ways that men today can hear. Because as I point out in the book, today the threat to manliness is not the, the next man's manliness. It's not the bully on the block or the rival in love. The threat today to manliness and uh, gentlemanliness is, is the culture, is, is the culture which, you know, that, that attacks gentlemen and men themselves, the, the very ideal, you know, toxic masculinity and so forth. And um, I feel like you have to, you know, you, you, that has to be stood, stood up for. I also feel that given all, even given all of the horrors of of you know, the men, uh, especially fathers, go through in the divorce courts and elsewhere. I do think it's important that men not become the mirror images of feminists. Uh, it bothers me when I hear men, uh, fathers groups, especially uh, using invoking feminist jargon, talking about sexism or gender equality and, and these sorts of things, kind of using the, the jargon of the very people that they're opposing. I, I don't think we can do that. And that's kind of what I mean in the book by ruling the world. I, I think that men, you know, when men start talking about um, being victims and so forth, even when they are, even when they are, they have a better claim than anyone I know of to make you victims uh, in, in some ways. Um, they can't say it. They can't say it. Um, uh, and because it, 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 you've got to assume that you are the natural, one of the natural rulers of society. Even if you're homeless, even if they're taking away your, your way in handcuffs, you, know, you are, uh, as a man, you are, um, you know, when you put away, men have to, one emotion that's absolutely toxic for men is any form of self-pity. Um, uh, any, anything like that, anything that sounds like mongery grievances, um, even when they're true. Now, what is the difference? I, I don't oppose men, uh, you know, joining uh, men's rights movements or, or putting, pointing out injustices uh, and, uh, and that's what, what, what is the difference? Where do you draw the line? What's the difference between a legitimate um, uh, 
act of uh, a, a political movement that seeks justice and uh, an ideology which is itself poisonous and, and grievance mongering. It's, it's hard to draw the line. I would say one thing, one place I would draw the line and I've, I've said this in other contexts, if your grievances would result in the increase in the power of the state, then they're probably wrong. In other words, if the things you're asking for, if, you, if, you, if your political agenda demands more government power in order to achieve what you think is justice, it's probably wrong and probably not in your best interest in the long run. If your agenda requires dim, diminishing government power, reducing the power of the state and increasing the power of citizens and people, householders, I might add, heads of households, then it's probably healthy. And the, you know, the, the important movements uh, I think in political history uh, have been those that tried to diminish the power of the state. The anti-slavery movement, the civil rights movement of the 1960s, the anti-communism of the, of the Eastern Europe in the 1980s, all of these sought to reduce the power of oppressive governments. Movements like radical feminism on the other hand, uh, it, and I think most of the homosexualist movement is in, in, concerned with increasing the power of the state. And I think that's neat suspect, needs to be examined and unhelpful. I think that's another area where we're on the exact same page, Stephen. Uh, if slightly from a different perspective, you know, a, a tagline to most of my work the past several years that I've used over and over again is there are no victims, only volunteers. Uh, I don't want an ideology of victimhood for men. I don't think it serves us. I don't think we're wired for an ideology of victimhood. We're wired for accountability. But when I say there's no victims, there only, there's only volunteers, what I'm talking about in that subtext is I don't volunteer for the state to govern my relationship and to own my children and to uh, own my assets and to loan me my wife for 10 years and then replace her with more demands from the state uh, at the under a gunpoint. Um, isn't that fitting with not being a victim? Absolutely, absolutely. And I uh, maybe I'll quote that in the next next edition of the book. Um, but yes, it's very much so. I, I um you know I think uh, a big role of fatherhood, uh, in my opinion, uh, of men is to teach men, teach young men when they're entering adolescence. Um, uh, you know, when they're that naturally, adolescence is the age where two things happen: one, your your sexual awakening happens, and two, your rebelliousness sets in. You, you're discontent with everything about the world. And I think one of the role of fathers is to teach young men to channel that discontent, that that rage that they have with the world. Uh, and to channel it into things that are constructive. Um, and I know that this was a role of my own father. My own father was politically quite left wing. Um, but when I would come up with grievances and anger about something and, and say all, all the things I thought was wrong with the world, he was always a presence that would help me. Uh, you know, he, he would always say to me, okay, you're, you may be right, but the way you're doing it is not gonna help. You've got to channel the, your anger and discontent into something constructive. And uh, I think that's what you know, a big part of what father, we rebel against our fathers. I mean, to this extent, Freud was correct, I think. And again, Howard Schwartz says something that we, we uh, the father is the first object of our rebellion. And it's at that point that we, the fathers teach us how to rebel constructively and you know, uh, to develop the habits um, which will help other people rather than tear down the world. And men that don't have that experience of fathers, uh, you know, that, that's why they do often tear down the world. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's, that's a real important, that's a basic principle to, to masculinity and, and paternity is how to channel your, your discontents and your grievances into something constructive. Alas, we agree again. Stephen, is there anything about this book that I haven't asked you about that you think you, you would like people to take away from it if they're considering whether or not to go buy it? Well, it's a good. So you're, you're one of the few interviewers, actually, who's actually pointed out the humor in the book. I, I like to think that the book is is readable and entertaining, um, because I you know it's it meant is. to be that way. It's it's full of ironies. Um, one of the things about writing the book that I discovered was how few of the attributes of a gentleman I I myself possessed. Uh, <laughs> writing the book made me more of one, uh, but I still <laughs> we could all be you know we could all be better. None of us is a perfect gentleman. Those even if you're born you know with a silver spoon in your mouth and you go to Eton and, and Oxford and 
um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you never really achieve perfection. So don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated by men who, are, who seem to have better backgrounds, better parents, better educations, um, you know, more snooty uh, uh, schools they went to or posh accents or, uh, you know, influential friends. It doesn't work that way. You can always be a gentleman, no matter what your age is. Uh, and it's like always, it's never too late to start. So, you know, I, I would urge men to take it on and, and spread it as a, 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 spread the word about this. And, and, and I look forward to feedback because I, I would like to do a, you know, another edition at some point. And I will be reviewing this soon on Amazon. Gentlemen, the name of the, and I'm not making a pun there, the name of the book is A Gentleman's Guide to Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World by Stephen Baskerville. Uh, there is a link below. If you would like to go get this book, go check it out. I find it to be great reading. Whether you agree with every line and passage or not, doesn't matter. Um, I would support Stephen's work, uh, always have. And that concludes our discussion. Um, thank you, Steve, for sharing some time with me today and with my audience. And I will look forward to the comments on this discussion as they come up. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it, too. I look forward right. to your review. Bye-bye.